then is wheelchair accessible. And this is 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It's 1 p.m. Up next, Tara Verde. From the Amazon basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is Adrienne Fitch Frankel, and today we're going to talk about the Energy Star labeling program. The way this particular uh, program came about uh, on Terra Verde is that about five years ago, I moved into an environmentally friendly, solar powered house and all the appliances were energy star labels uh, labeled um, and, and ostensibly uh, energy efficient but I quickly realized something was very amiss with the with the uh, dryer um, and uh, personally I'm actually a big proponent of drip drying but there are certain things I do throw into the dryer and it took and this particular dryer that was energy star labeled actually took two to three times longer than any uh, dryer uh, dryer I'd ever used before and so it really made me wonder you know what does the the Energy Star label do for consumers? What does it mean? Is the system working or does it need improvement? And I presume a lot of you may be wondering the same thing about the Energy Star appliances in your home or the ones that you're thinking of, of acquiring. So um, so let's find out. Our guest today will help answer these questions. Uh, and by the way, Energy Star can apply to both consumer products and to homes and buildings, but today we'll just talk about the consumer products angle. Uh, so uh, first of all, we have uh, as one guest uh, Tim Ballo. He's the associate attorney with Earth Justice. He'll be joining us from his office in D.C. And Celia Lehrman, deputy home editor at Consumer Reports based in New York. Energy Star was invited to appear on this program but said that they didn't have a spokesperson who could appear today. All right, so let's start out and find out what Energy Star is. Tim, do you want to tell us? Well, Energy Star is a uh, program uh, that helps to uh, helps consumers identify products in the marketplace that are more efficient than the typical run-of-the-mill products. Um, it, it's largely implemented uh, voluntarily. Manufacturers uh, volunteer to certify their products for the Energy Star label. Um, if they meet the standard, they get to put the label on the products, and, and folks that go to stores uh, who are looking for an efficient product will, will see the label and know that their product is uh, is one of the best out there. All right. And um, Celia, uh, do the, spe- are the specifications the same for every um, item within a category, or, um, or are they different for each, each They're item? They're different. They're different, and that's something people probably don't know looking at the uh, those familiar yellow labels. For refrigerators, there are different requirements depending on the kind of refrigerator. So side-by-sides have different requirements than ones with the freezer on top and freezer on the bottom. So you can actually, same thing with washing machines, top loaders and front loaders have different standards. So just looking for the Energy Star is a good start, but it's really not enough. And, you know, before this week when I started really researching this in depth, you know, I always thought of it as no different than, say, the organic label where, you know, you go out and it's kind of the same thing no matter what. It's it's a fixed standard. Um, But but actually what I've learned this week is that it changes over time, doesn't it? It, um, The Energy Star label actually keeps getting ostensibly higher and higher in terms of the requirements. That's true. That's true. They keep uh, raising the bar on it as the products get more efficient. And that's probably because the program was set to identify the top 25% in a particular category, so the most energy efficient. And as more products have gotten energy, you know, more energy efficient, in order for them to really still be identifying the best performers, the top energy performers, they had to keep raising the bar. 
All right. Tim, there are federal standards for energy efficiency and there's Energy Star, but these are two different things. Can you explain uh, just briefly how those two things relate to each other to help us kind of set a foundation for the program? Sure. Um, There are federal standards for just about everything. If it's big and you plug it into a wall, chances are there's a federal standard that applies. And I think um, that the... uh, the, the, um, what we just were talking about, about the, the Energy Star standards improving over time, um, a lot of the reason why we're seeing more energy-efficient products coming on the market is because we also have federal minimum standards um, that say that all products must be at least this level of efficiency, and some will go beyond and meet the Energy Star. But as we um, also ratchet up the minimum standards, it provides a real incentive for manufacturers who want to who want to differentiate and capture that segment of the market that's looking for the most efficient products to uh, dedicate the funding to uh, research and development to come out with those more efficient products that in turn sort of move the the top tier, move the energy star standard forward as well. Tim, how does this program actually benefit the environment? Well, um, a lot of electricity in the U.S., I think roughly about half, comes from coal-fired power plants that produce a lot of uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and other pollutants. So when you're uh, obtaining the same services from a product, when you have a, a refrigerator that operates just as well as uh, your old uh, refrigerator used to operate, but it consumes less electricity, that's less power plant emissions. And Celia, how does this program benefit consumers? Well, it, cons- it benefits consumers because if, if, pl- if the products are using less energy, you're paying less in terms of your energy for the appliance. So your utility bills can go down, or really they're probably not going to go up as much because the cost of electricity keeps going up. So what, en- what it means is you're saving money running the appliances. Um, so I think that that's, that's where the benefit is for consumers. And it also benefits the consumers indirectly um, or directly because you have a cleaner environment. All right. Tim, if you buy Energy Star, are you sure to be getting the most energy-efficient technologies out there, or is there anything misleading about it? Well, it's going to vary some product to product, um, and part of the reason for that is, is what we were just discussing about how you have to keep moving the Energy Star standard up over time. Um, in the past, there has been some uh, failures to do that, and, and at times certain products um, went far beyond the 25% of the market that was uh, intended uh, for the standard to reflect, um, and, and you might have a, a brief period of time or even a couple years where half or more of the products on the market meet the Energy Star label just because the, the label hasn't been updated. Actually, Celia, your um, organization, Consumer Reports, has pointed out that you know, that there's a, a concern around uh, having so many of uh, uh, the products in any certain category um, uh, qualifying for the label. Uh, what, what is the, the concern there? Well, the concern is that you you end up not having any real value for the label. If everybody gets an A, then what does that mean? And there's also not as much value for the consumers because you you really, as as we were talking, it's supposed to be, you know, the top products. But if everything is good, then the person who really wants to get a more energy-efficient product is really not served by the energy star. And and I think that that's the problem. The problem is you, you want to be sure that if, if the idea is to get them the most efficient product, you want to be sure that the Energy Star qualifications are actually stringent so that not everybody is getting an Energy Star. It sort of defeats the whole purpose of it. So how frequently are the standards actually updated? Not often enough, in our opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, it, it, they have a recurring schedule, and a lot of it is legislation is mandated by legislation. But it can be, you know, seven years between the uh, standards being updated, um, or it can be more. And it certainly is uh, also a problem. You know, we touched upon those minimum energy standards and the minimum energy tests that the manufacturers um, are mandated to go by. And if those test procedures don't get updated to reflect what's available in the technology, then you end up skewing the results. 
of the Energy Star program. For example, um, many of the standards for refrigerators were written when, in the 70s actually, when most refrigerators were manually controlled. They didn't really have any electronic controls. Um, they didn't have the kinds of lighting that they have now. They don't have the filtration systems that they have now. Uh, they don't have, many of these have um, add-ons like uh, I was mentioning to you in a conversation, Samsung just introduced refrigerators with LCD screens on them. So there are a lot of things that are being introduced, technologies that either um, can make the product more efficient or less efficient, but it, they're not uh, in the testing standards. So none of those energy uses get reflected in the numbers you see on the, on the uh, yellow stickers. All right, and we'll probably be coming back to testing later on in the program if we have time. Um, so, Tim, you know, based on what Celia just said, by the time the standards take effect, has the technology already outgrown them? I understand it can take up to six years for the, the technology, for the standards to actually take us, uh, you know, to take um, over, but, you know, the, uh, the, the technology could change overnight. Yeah, that's the, the, the minimum standards that the, the Department of Energy sets. There's a roughly a six-year uh, period for most products, uh, sort of a lock-in. Once you have a new standard, it, it stays into effect, and you revisit it in six years. Part of the reason for that is that the manufacturers um, want to be able to uh, make the investment to retool and, and meet new standards and and then have a few years to, to recoup those investments before the standard is adjusted again. Um, so it it definitely can be a problem for the minimum standards to, to not be updated more frequently, but there is a reason why it happens that way. Actually, Tim, one of the interesting things that I've seen that Earth Justice has pointed out is that um, sometimes the higher standards are possible even with existing t technologies because of that time lag. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, often what you do to, to make something more efficient isn't, the cutting edge technology it's it's adding more insulation or putting in a, a better motor to drive the compressor you know it's uh, it's not necessarily always a great leap forward to re-engineer a whole new product all right and see you one other issue but, but that's an interesting point that you bring up because you're right with a lot of the electronics these days um changing the efficiency is a matter of upgrading and tweaking the software as opposed to having to sort of re-engineer the product so that's part of the reason, too, that uh, it sort of begs, you know, the question that you, they don't really need that many years necessarily to recoup because sometimes the tweaks are really software tweaks as opposed to sort of I've got to restart the line and, and do something very different. Mm, so, like, the cost to businesses actually might not be that great. Mm -hmm. And um, one other time lag that's involved is um, the time between manufacture and marketing and sale of a product. Uh, Celia, do you want to talk a little bit about this, how, you know, there might be a time lag actually in terms of, you know, products on the market that might have the label but are not actually still qualified? Well, I think what, what I think we're talking about is that when the new Energy Star requirements go into effect, they usually go into effect uh, the first of a month. Usually, it's often in um, January first or July first, depending on the product. And what happens is, if you look look at the familiar labels and people are used to seeing them on their appliances, it'll say Energy Star, but underneath it, there's no date on it. So that you don't know what dates the, the standard qualifies for. So in that period, let's say as of today, there was a product and the standards became more efficient. And you heard a story in the media, oh, you know, um, dishwasher standards, dishwashers have gotten much more energy efficient. There's a brand new Energy Star standard in effect right now. And you say, well, that's great. Now's a good time to go buy a dishwasher. And I go to the store and I'm looking at a dishwasher and it says it's Energy Star. But you don't know whether it applies to the standard that was in effect a week ago, which was the old standard, or the new standard, because there is no date underneath the Energy Star. The only way for you to know is to actually check the Department of Energy website, the Energy Star website, and look for that specific model number. And that's a little cumbersome for the average person. 
All right. This is Adrian Fitch Frankel. You're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in, in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. You're listening to Tim Ballo of Earth Justice and Celia Lehrman of, of Consumer Reports. Um, so a, another critique is that, um, you know, since there are different standards for different categories, for example, like a, you know, a fridge, a front loading fridge, we've talked about this already, you know, or a fridge with ice uh, coming out the front, um, you know, each, each one of those subcategories is going to have a different standard. Um, it, it is, you know, there's some confusion. And actually, um, Tim, you've um, you've actually made an analogy of this to miles per gallon that it's different. Like, how would it be? What's an alternative vision where um, you know there could be some standardization, like MPG, where it looks the same across different um, all the different subcategories of a product? Yeah, you know, it's the the system is structured around the idea that when people go to the store to look at for a new refrigerator, they have exactly in their mind what they're looking for. They want they either want through the door ice or they, you know, they want to have to open the door to get water out or an ice out of the fridge. They want the the freezer on the bottom or the top. And, and, and these things make a difference from the standpoint of energy consumption. Um, but when you subdivide uh, a product like refrigerators into all these different classes based on all these features, some of which may have some value to some customers but not others, you're, you're not really presenting a clear picture uh, of what the energy consumption uh, of different products is. It's sort of like if you um, have fuel efficiency labels for cars, um, and and the SUVs are graded one way and the compacts are graded another way, um, you know, it, it can sort of mask uh, the most fuel efficient SUV, maybe you know, terribly fuel inefficient when compared to some of the, the smaller cars. So are there any alternative proposals out there that say, you know, maybe the Energy Star label would say, okay, you know, this this thing consumes X amount of, of energy per day rather than, you know, just saying, you know, just kind of having the, the Energy the Star. Well, the there. current labels, what they also have on them in addition to the Energy Star is it talks about how many kilowatt per hours they use per year. And it also gives you a dollar figure based on um, average energy costs. And that number applies across categories. But if you're asking what does the system look like when they're all compared equally, it looks like Consumer Reports ratings for appliances because that's how we do um, our efficiency ratings for appliances. We use the same measure across categories so that when you're com- trying to compare a top freezer to a bottom freezer to a side-by-side, you to a built-in refrigerator, you can see how efficient they are across categories. We do it that way. We do the same thing with um, washing machines. We compare efficiency across categories. So, um, I mean, that's to toot our own horn, but that is how we do it, just so that people can easily glance through our ratings and find the most efficient products and the products that perform the best as well. Because that's another thing, the Energy Star ratings don't take, for the most part, for appliances, don't take performance into account. Um, Going back to Tim, um, I'm wondering um, if we've seen some change over time in terms of a standard setting, um, you know, especially between this administration and the last administration. Were there any changes? Absolutely. Um, In the last administration, you know, there was an ideological opposition to interference in the market. So the minimum standards uh, generally didn't get set for many years. They fell. Uh, they were behind on some two dozen products uh, setting minimum standards, and they got sued by Natural Resources Defense Council and a, and a group of states and put on a schedule for uh, for completing all the overdue rulemakings. And uh, to the partial credit of the Bush administration, they did eventually start complying with the law. Um, however, they did so by adopting the weakest standards they could. Um, and uh, one of the huge, I, th- I think, more than maybe any other agency, the Department of Energy has really changed its approach to energy efficiency under the Obama administration. Um, they are now adopting much stronger minimum efficiency standards, which obviously in turn drives, uh, drives the Energy Star standard forward. 
Because they've also done a very good job, I think, with, with enforcement. and com- They're doing a better job with enforcement and compliance. I mean, they set up an office for enforcement and compliance, and I think that they're, they're really um, now they've set up a verification program. So I think they're also not only setting the standards but, but trying very hard to make sure that um, the standards are being upheld. That's true. There really was zero attention paid to enforcement until the Obama administration came in. Um, the department didn't test products. They, they didn't uh, bother to enforce, and no one was policing the uh, the labeling of products online or in stores. And all, all those things are starting to happen. But, I mean, I think because you, you're right, because it's another big thing, too, in terms of it's just as of this year that um, the numbers you see on the Energy Star labels are actually independently verified. Prior to that, the manufacturers were doing their own testing, putting the information on the labels, and the government was saying thank you very much. And the program got um, badly embarrassed when uh, someone did a study of cooking up sort of make-believe products uh, the GAI. <laughs> yes and that that they got energy star certified because there really wasn't anyone watching yeah you guys are great you're like answering the last like, five <laughs> questions i had exactly <laughs> one by one on the list um so yeah with that with that particular report um actually one of the the products that was uh, approved from what i understand was a gas powered alarm clock um so you know what does this what does this say about the energy star program I, I think it says that that it it showed it showed some glaring problems with it, and to their credit, they are now you know they're now dealing with those problems. So I mean, it what was interesting also in that study is they found that the only products that didn't automatically get Energy Star, there were, are some products at, even at that point where they had to submit to third party verification, and those products didn't get the Energy Star because they weren't verified. So I think it made the case even stronger for the fact that they needed independent verification for for the uh, for the products to qualify for the Energy Star, which is what they now do. All right. Um, now, Earth Justice actually used a court challenge to address standards on residential furnaces. And one of the interesting things about that, uh, how that unfolded, is that um, it, one thing that happened was that you ended up coming up with, up with an agreement directly with the manufacturers, uh, which was which actually ended up being a stronger standard. So um, I was wondering, in your talks with with manufacturers, what's, what has been your experience? Are they really hostile to change? Are they open to change? Like, what, what are the possibilities of working with them? It's seems to be entirely determined by if you're the guy with the more efficient technology <laughs> or if you're the guy that produces the really crummy stuff. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, now um, the one thing, Celia, I'd love to hear more about is um, how energy efficient products perform. You know, they may be energy efficient, but do they actually work? And this kind of gets back to my dryer um, or at my last. Well, time. they actually really do. Okay. I mean, we have we in our tests um, we find lots of products that not only uh, perform well and are energy efficient, but that also don't cost that much more. Um, we are in our we've been testing you know, washing machines forever, basically for the last seventy five years, and um, we've seen uh, top front loading washing machines. Uh, and top loading and for some of our last batch there was a two thousand dollar washer and it was great you know it was a great performer very energy efficient and you go well doesn't that sort of make the case that it's making it more expensive but underneath it it's brand mate cost six hundred and fifty dollars it performed as well and it was six hundred and fifty dollars. It cleaned as well. It was energy efficient. It's water efficient. So it's really a matter of of doing the shopping, because a lot of the um, you, know, you can you can get both or you can get neither. Quite frankly, so you have to be a, a careful shopper. And you know, for your dryer, one of the things they're talking about is they're talking about extending um, Energy Star standards to dryers. Currently, dryers don't have any Energy Star standards, and most dryers actually use the same amount of energy. 
Actually, I wanted to ask you another question about shopping. Um, you know, as as consumers look, you know, a lot of people are probably listening right now and kind of looking around their homes, like looking at those energy la- star labels, wondering or the lack thereof, and you know what to do. You know, is it? Um, it but then you have this other issue of you know, okay, so if you have an old appliance, you send it to landfill is also not a great idea. So you know, if if you're if you're a consumer, a householder, you know, can you test your own appliance to see how energy efficient is or how do you evaluate whether you're going to save money and have a positive environmental impact um, by do- making a replacement? Well, so there are actually two things. There are actually some products out there called a kilowatt and a watt meter that will let you plug your plug themselves into the outlet where you have a product and you can see how much energy it's using so that can give you a baseline. But also I think on the Department of Energy, the Energy Star website, they also have calculators where you can plug in the age of your appliance or the approximate age of your appliance, and it'll give you an idea of how much energy and money you'd save by updating your appliance. So those are two ways you can sort of figure it out for yourself uh, to see if it makes makes sense. Um, Also, it'll make sense, obviously, you probably want to replace the oldest appliances in your home first. Uh, the oldest and the ones that are on 24-7, like a refrigerator, because those will be the biggest bang for your energy buck. All right. So let's loop back to something uh, we were talking about earlier, but take a forward futuristic thinking, uh, or sorry, forward-looking view on it. Um, Tim, if you were going to say how, um, you know, what would be the best system for raising standards and keeping them up to date as we move forward, what would you say? Um, I, I, it, it sounds a little like you're asking, what do we need to improve? Yes. And uh, this goes back to the, the testing issue. Um, you know, it, it, it's generally the case that nobody knows, nobody can know as much about these products as the people that make them. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the testing procedures are developed by the manufacturers. And we're, we're kind of almost at their mercy to, to improve these testing procedures just because they have um, this, this highly specialized knowledge about these products that really no one else has. And they're the ones who, who the Department of Energy and who EPA have looked to um, manufacturers and trade associations to update these testing procedures just because they're the ones who, who can do it. All right. Um, So that's about all the time we have for today's show. Um, I'd like to invite both of you to give your website URLs so that we can, so that um, our listeners can learn more about your programs and also if you could uh, give us your telephone numbers. Um, So let's start with Earth Justice. Um, At at www.earthjustice, all one word, dot org. And uh, my number is 202. 667-4500. Six six seven forty five hundred. All right. So that was earthjustice.org, and the phone number is 202-667-4500. And if you want to dial locally, uh, the local office is 510-550-6700. Celia? It's uh, www.consumerreports.org, and um, my phone number is 914-378-2000. All right. That was 914-378-2000. And there's also an 800 number, 866-208-9427. And uh, I just want to add in, if you're interested in more of the recommendations, um, Consumer Reports does have a great article from October 2010 online with more recommendations. I know we ran out of time to get um, recommendations from Celia, but you can go online and find more information there. So uh, thank you you so much. Everybody have a great weekend um, and uh, thanks to Erica Bridgman for being our engineer. Um, this show and others are available from kpfa.org for your listening convenience. Have a great weekend. On Friday, July 29th at 8 o'clock p.m., Leon Russelson and Rob Johnson will be performing their musical collaboration, The Liberty Tree, a celebration of the life and writings of Thomas Paine. 
These two acclaimed folk singers weave together Payne's words and life history and add a new dimension to his radical ideas with their own contemporary songs. This benefit concert will be held at the Unitarian Universalist Church at 505 East Charleston Road in Palo Alto, a wheelchair-accessible venue. A $20 suggested donation benefits Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. The event is co-sponsored by PPJC, Reach and Teach, and PM Press. For more information or advanced tickets, call 650-326-8837 or visit www.peaceandjustice.org. You are listening.